Welcome everybody to this um, IANIS um, webinar on climate change and health. My name is Jeremy McNeil. I'm the president of the Royal Society of Canada who is hosting this event. The Royal Society of Canada offices are located on the uh, traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Uh, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of the Inuit First Nations and Meti people from coast to coast to coast and recognize the very important contributions the indigenous peoples have made to this land that many of us call Turtle Island. I should say that obviously this is an IANIS um, event. As you can see here, yeah, IANIS is a network of uh, academies of science um, from North to South America. And we work together and we are one of four regional networks of IAP, which is the Inter-Academy Partnership. And as you can see on the next slide, there are um, four regional networks um, that including our own IANIS, there is the African, the uh, Asian and European networks. And the genesis of this current project arose as you can see from a publication that was uh, put out by ESAC, the European, uh, European Academies um, Partnership that you can see here that came out in 2019. And as a result of that, Leopoldina, the German Academy and the Inter-Academy Partnership sought funding from the German Federal Ministry of Education for us to the other three networks to uh, produce similar publications um, for the three regional networks, and then eventually to produce a global report that is being based on the four regional ones. And we're very fortunate to have with us today as a panelist, um, uh, Dr. Robin Fears, who is actually Lee, one of the leads in putting together the um, uh, ESAC report and is uh, the lead on the global report that will be coming out later this year. Um, and so we decided at uh, the IANIS level, uh, having discussed with my co-chair, um, Dr. Elena Nader from Brazil, we decided to take the same approach that had been taken in a previous report that we had done for the region that was related to um, sustainable agriculture that you can see here. Um, that where we basically contacted everybody. We um, got together and discussed how we would uh, proceed and we contacted all of the academies uh, in IANIS asking for suggestions as to um, themes, uh, people that could get involved. And as you can see, we came up with a steering committee uh, based on the recommendations that came from all of the academies. And the idea was we would proceed as before, meeting in person, having a, a meeting with all of the academies. Um, of course, that didn't happen thanks to COVID. And so um, it was done very much, um, as you can imagine, online. And um, the final report is now ready and you will be able to see it online. It will be posted at the end of this meeting both on the RSC, IANIS, and IAP websites. I should note that the, um, it is a um, proof copy that will be posted and the original will, or the final copy will be available in just um, a few days. It will then also be translated into um, Spanish, Portuguese, and French, as well as the English version that is there now. So I am really pleased today to welcome you all and the, the uh, panelists who are here today. Um, Christy Bay, who is uh, from the United States, Robin uh, Fears, who is from the UK, uh, Charlie Flowers from uh, the uh, Inuit uh, Research, uh, Martin Ford um, from Granada. Um, uh, Andy Haynes was unable to join us but he, we have a recording and uh, his place, if you like, will be taken by Robin um, when we uh, get to the question and answers. Um, and uh, Sherry Lee will be there 
um, obviously, and she will be talking next and giving you much more information about the report. And also um, we have Ines who will be joining us as well, uh, Shuak. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over the podium now, if you like, if there was a podium, because this is virtual, not normal, uh, to Sherry Lee, who I have to say right up front has been an amazing leader in this project. And I personally am very grateful to her um, for all the work she has done to date. So Sherry Lee, if you could start off giving us a resume of the um, report as it is uh, presented. So thank you very much, Sherry Lee. It's such a great pleasure to be here today to talk about climate change and health and provide an overview of our report for the Americas. The report was led by the Inter-American Network of Academies of Sciences, or IANIS, as well as the Inter-Academy Partnership. It's a rigorous report that's authored by more than 29 leading scientific experts from 10 different countries. And we received peer review comments and edits by 19 different experts from six different countries. With nearly 700 studies cited in the report, it represents a state of the science assessment of climate change impacts on health in the Americas, as well as potential solutions available that can help us reduce some of these impacts. Now, of course, this was no small feat. When, our, our, when we first started, our team was tasked with assessing the state of climate change and human health across all of the Americas, which is an incredibly diverse region. The region includes different countries, different economies, languages, cultures, geographies, climates. And our challenge was to try and synthesize the state of climate change and health science for a region that includes the Arctic and the Amazon. It includes mega cities and small remote communities. It includes coastal communities, mountain regions, and deserts, and ranges from regions that contribute some of the highest greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it also includes some of the regions that contribute the least to climate change. So this was a huge challenge for our team and for the steering committee. And we wanted to really cover the depth and nuance of the topic, including how climate change was differentially impacting different populations and peoples, but also covering some of the broader and more systemic underlying drivers of vulnerability and risk. So in order to balance covering both the breadth and the depth of climate change impacts on health across the Americas, we took a two-pronged approach. First, we synthesized common pathways through which climate change was impacting health in the Americas, and then we provided in-depth case studies to highlight the diversity of impacts that we've already observed throughout the Americas. So, for example, we included 14 different case studies that ranged in topics from climate change impacts on health in a specific region to climate change and health solutions for different regions, and, you know, for example, there was a case study outlining how climate change is impacting water quality in the Caribbean. And we had another case study example that looked um, really in depth at how climate change was impacting Indigenous peoples throughout the Americas. To assess the state of science um, and knowledge on the topic, our IANIS report draws on and builds from and really advances previous syntheses, providing an in-depth examination of climate change and health in the Americas and presents case studies to highlight this climate health nexus. Our main target audience was decision makers in the Americas, as well as those whose work depends on or is influenced by the Americas. So we really focused on synthesizing uh, evidence to really inform decision making as our main goal. But we also identified research gaps that have really important policy relevance and implications. So to do this, we really prioritize citing systematic reviews, which use rep, uh, replicable and transparent methods to summarize climate change and health literature. And this is because these types of uh, synthesis studies are often the most methodologically rigorous sources of information and evidence on climate change and health topics. But at the same time, we also cite other literature to illustrate particular topics, um, specific case studies, or different regional examples. So overall, uh, we realize that our approach doesn't provide an exhaustive bibliographic listing of all the research that's ever been done on this topic throughout the Americas, but instead we focus on really trying to enable an assessment of the bigger picture science policy questions while adding depth and nuance through case study examples. We aim to answer several questions in the report, ranging from identifying the major health risks in the Americas to who's at greatest risk. 
And while identifying these risks is really critical, we also focus on identifying and assessing potential strategies to try and reduce these risks and to protect public health. And this is exactly how we structured our report. The first part of the report documents how climate change has increased health risks in the Americas. And then the second part of the report focuses on response options to reduce climate health impacts. Um, and we assess those and we make recommendations that are underpinned by equity, rights, as well as transdisciplinarity to try and paint the pathway forward for climate resilient uh, futures. So what I would like to do with the rest of my presentation is, is share the six key messages and key findings from the report. The first key message is that climate change is impacting health in the Americas now. The health impacts of climate change are not just something that's project, projected to happen you know, far in the future. Climate change has already impacted our health today. Certainly, climate change has arrived in the Americas, and we've already experienced record-breaking increases in mean and extreme temperatures, lengthened wildfire seasons, increased intensity and frequency of extreme precipitation and floods. We've already seen ocean warming and permafrost thaw, uh, more drought. We've seen sea level rise and coastal flooding and erosion. And all of these Im things impact our entire planet, and they also present urgent global public health challenges. They impact the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, the water that we drink, and all of these things impact our health. And we know that these health risks will be greater with greater degrees of global warming. So the report examines these key health risks in this context. While climate change impacts many facets of our life, we know um, that these key risks include things like heat-related morbidity and mortality, air pollution related illnesses, nutrition and food security concerns, mental health and well-being challenges, respiratory health impacts, and waterborne, foodborne, and vector-borne diseases throughout the Americas. And the report looks at the pathways through which climate change has impacted each of these health outcomes, and also looks at how these risks might increase in the future under different levels of global warming. Then for each of these health outcomes, we explore specific adaptation strategies that might reduce these risks. And the key message is that across all of these health outcomes, the evidence is clear. Climate change has already impacted our health and increased warming will continue to increase these risks. But while we know that specific adaptation strategies are available to reduce risks, these strategies become less and less effective with increased levels of warming. The second key message from the report is that climate change converges with and compounds other health crises. And clearly climate change impacts on health do not happen in a vacuum. And the COVID-19 pandemic has made this very clear. Our report comes at a time when the effects of the climate crisis on human health converge with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past years, two years, we've all seen how health systems have had to respond to COVID-19, as well as the impacts of record-breaking heat waves, intense storms and disasters and wildfires. For example, in July, 2020, Hurricane Hannah made landfall on Southern uh, Texas at a time when the state was experiencing the highest COVID-19 hospitalization incidents in the United States. And efforts to you know, uh, help people evacuate and provide shelter for people while simultaneously limiting viral transmission presented very clear and difficult logistical challenges. And residents um, also often chose not to evacuate due to fear of COVID-19 risks and they risked injury and drowning. So these, these impacts and these crises don't happen alone or in a vacuum, they converge and compound each other. Our fourth key message is that while the health risks of climate change are clear, there are also solutions available. Our report makes it clear that climate change action will improve uh, human health in the Americas. In our report, we address how through adaptation and mitigation efforts, our health systems can adapt to and cope with current and expected climate change while simultaneously reducing harmful health impacts. So for example, Climate change adaptations include things like raising public health awareness of the climate change and health risks, including improved climate health education in schools. It includes things like 
um, making sure that we have robust heat action plans, modifying the built environment to cope with higher temperatures, as well as, as doing things like explicitly incorporating health provisions into disaster, disaster risk management plans. Early warning systems and response systems are also critical, as well as incorporating mental health impacts into disaster risk management. We also highlight how things like integrated environment and health surveillance and response systems, as well as improved access to key services, including improved water sanitation and hygiene systems can also reduce climate change risks. But it's really important to remember that when developing these adaptation strategies to reduce the health risks of climate change, it's also essential that the health sector coordinates its efforts with other sectors, including sectors like uh, water and sanitation, energy, food production, transportation, housing, education, and land use planning. We know that there are a lot of health benefits from adaptation strategies that happen outside of the health sector. But we also know that there are limits to our ability to adapt to future climate change. And while we know that there are feasible and effective strategies that can reduce our risk today, these strategies become less and less effective with greater levels of global warming. And that's why adaptation must come hand in hand with mitigation efforts to reduce our emissions and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. There are clear benefits to drastically reducing our emissions to meet the Paris Agreement targets. And our report provides examples of how climate change mitigation can improve health um, and reduce healthcare costs both now and decades into the future. So we provide examples of things like the health benefits of phasing out the use of coal, how to modify our transportation systems to reduce emissions, which can also provide environmental and health benefits. And we also talk about um, how to think about low emissions diets to improve health. Our fifth key message emphasizes that addressing equity and justice really underpin effective climate change actions that improve health. Climate change impacts the health of everyone in a complex way that is often highly dependent on where we live and, and the subpopulation that we're talking about. An individual's health risks can be influenced by a number of factors, including their current health status, as well as their socioeconomic and environmental conditions that they live in, the governance structures in the places that they live, um, among other factors. And we know that climate change impacts are already dis, uh, distributed unfairly, and they exacerbate insecurities and injustices that are already experienced by vulnerable populations. And many of these are underpinned by ongoing and historical colonialism. Finally, based on the evidence that we assessed in this report, it's really clear that we need to implement an emergency response to climate change. Equity has to be at the core of effective responses, and it must be at the core of all local, regional, and international research, as well as policy responses moving forward. Actions taken now to build climate health resilient futures will reduce future risks, and investing in climate resilient infrastructure, programming, and healthcare systems will help support adaptation and decrease future health risks from climate change. We also highlight how a cross-sectoral and global collaboration is absolutely critical. Addressing research gaps and acting on the current evidence base will require intersectional, um, intersectoral, and interdisciplinary approaches that bring decision makers together with scientists to, to pave a pathway forward. So at the beginning of our assessment, the team considered the task of examining the wide range and diverse impacts of climate change on health across the Americas as our major challenge. But as the assessment came together, this challenge actually became our strength. And by examining the wide ranging impacts of climate change on health, we are able to really highlight and synthesize key pathways through which climate change increases health risks. And by examining and assessing the wide range of climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies that are available across the Americas, we were also able to explore common elements that underpin successful strategies. So in closing, overall, our report shows that while climate change presents clear health risks in the Americas, there are also effective and feasible response options that are available. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry Lee. Um, I very much appreciate that. Uh, very nice overview of the challenges and how 
uh, the various authors rose to the occasion. As Sherry Lee pointed out, we have two aspects that we had to consider, both the um, adaptation and mitigation, as well as looking at very specific cases. And today's program covers um, several of these in different ways. And I'm very happy now to introduce uh, Sir Andy Haynes, who is a world-renowned uh, expert as it relates to climate change and health. And he has agreed um, to present on the mitigation aspect. So if we could now have the recording that was uh, presented by Andy, I'd greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to give a brief introduction to the Global Synthesis Report of the Inter-Academy um, Climate and Health, Climate Change and Health Project. Um, I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person, but delighted to hand over to Robin Fears, who's the lead author of the report for the question and answer. So I'm going to give you a, a very uh, brief overview of the um, scope of the report, uh, which uh, is, uh, been, has been going on since November 2019, and it's scheduled to end this year, it's led by the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, um, and it was uh, preceded by the regional report uh, for Europe, uh, published in 2019. And some of the regional reports, indeed the global synthesis report, has built on um, the achievements of the European report. As you know, there are three regional reports, and the global synthesis report highlights the regional similarities and differences. And it provides advice for decision makers, for guidance around implementation at global, regional, and national levels of policies which can help to um, either adapt to or mitigate uh, climate change through reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also improve health. It aims to take into account local circumstances and strategic needs. And it will be published um, in the second quarter of 2022. There's already been a, an initial uh, report published in PLOS Medicine uh, last year, around the middle of last year, which was part of the efforts to seek feedback from the scientific community. And this brief overview on evidence-informed policy for tackling the adverse climate change effects on health emphasised the need to link regional and global assessments of, of, of science to catalyse actions, coordinating policy across regions, sectors and governance levels, and in, very importantly, to understand the potential trade-offs on inadvertent consequences of climate policies Many of them, of course, are beneficial to health, but poorly designed policies can have adverse effects on health, for example, by increasing poverty um, through increasing cost of uh, renewable energy, for example, compared with cheaper uh, fossil fuel alternatives. So the, um, the Global Synthesis Report aims to quite comprehensively really uh, assess the various exposure pathways by which climate change can impact on human health and of course, these pathways are modulated through a range of demographic, socioeconomic, environmental and other factors that influence the magnitude and pattern of risks, um, as uh, summarised in this slide. Now, it, it does deal with the, a range, a spectrum of exposure pathways, right from the very uh, direct ones like extreme weather events, uh, heat stress, for example, heat related illness, increased mortality, particularly amongst the elderly as a result of extreme heat. Uh, and also the effects on labour productivity, effects on air quality, for example, by increasing wildfires, effects on water quality and quantity, including a whole range of water, waterborne diseases, effects on food supply and safety, both the effects of climate change on crop yields, not just staple crops, but also fruit and vegetables are important, of course, for, for human health, but also the changes in the nutritional quality of foods as we increase carbon dioxide, the levels of micronutrients like zinc and iron decline, of course. It also, of course, encompasses the effects of climate change on vector-borne disease distribution and ecology, notably, of course, malaria and dengue being important vector-borne uh, diseases. And finally, it, it also seeks to address some of the indirect effects through the social factors, uh, the effects of um, forced migration, 
of increasing poverty and perhaps also of a violent conflict as well. And importantly, it emphasizes not just the physical health effects, but also the mental health effects of climate change, which as we're now recognizing are, are pervasive and sometimes long lasting. This slide just illustrates one of the issues that's raised in the report and discussed, the whole issue of uh, attribution of health effects to climate change. In other words, not just making general statements about the relationship between extreme events or extreme heat and climate change, but also um, describing which events and which trends are likely to be due to human-induced climate change rather uh, than natural variation. And of course, the science now is advancing very, very quickly. And we've already got a number of important papers in the literature. Uh, this paper is referenced in the report. And it shows us that about a third or more of total heat deaths from 1990 to 2018 can be attributed to human-induced climate change using data from over 700 sites in 43 countries. So that's an important um, uh, development in terms of building the evidence base linking climate change and human health. But it also shows us where so there are some important gaps, and this is also an issue discussed in the Global Synthesis Report. There, in this particular study, for example, there was no data from much of Africa and Asia. And the report uh, emphasizes the need to collect better data, monitoring and surveillance data that will allow us to look, particularly in vulnerable populations, where there's often a lack of data, uh, to, to determine what is precisely happening on the ground uh, as climate change um, uh, escalates uh, around the world. But the, the report also emphasizes uh, very strongly the need for solutions and climate action, urgent climate action, motivated by the knowledge that this can improve health. Both adaptation is essential, adaptation is essential because we're already about 1.2 degrees, as you know, global average temperature increase. So there are certain impacts that cannot be uh, prevented and we'll need to adapt as best we can. And that can be through heat early warning systems, through disease early warning systems, disaster early warning systems, more resilient healthcare systems that are able to bounce back from extreme events uh, uh, to function in the face of, of climate disruption. Uh, and of course, mitigation action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. And traditionally, of course, these two actions have been rather divorced in policy terms and in research terms as well. But increasingly, of course, we need to integrate adaptation and mitigation in order to safeguard human health as, as much as we can. This, um, this, uh, the report also identifies another gap, which is a gap in evidence around adaptation and to some extent mitigation as well, in terms of the health benefits of adaptation strategies, particularly in low and middle income countries, as summarized at the bottom of this slide. So some important evidence gaps, but there's a lot that we do know and needs to be implemented without delay. And this also, this uh, slide just emphasizes, and again, it's referenced in the report, the potentially very large public health benefits of adhering to the Paris Agreement targets based on this recent publication uh, in uh, 2021. And this uh, publication um, was a modeling study that looked across nine countries uh, and estimated the benefits of nationally determined contributions. These are the contributions that countries make under the Paris Agreement that put um, health at the center of new climate policies to meet the well below two degree goal of the Paris Agreement. And it showed that this could reduce annual deaths due to air pollution by over 1.6 million, annual deaths due to diet related risk factors by over 6.4 million, and annual deaths attributable to physical inactivity by almost 2.1 million. So very major health benefits, not just from re reducing um, the risks of dangerous climate change, which are not included in these estimates, but from the near-term co-benefits of uh, climate change mitigation policies across a range of different sectors. And you can see from the slide how the relative importance of these different policies varies according to which country we're, we're considering. But the benefits are large for each country and, and for each of these three uh, different mechanisms. And um, the, the other, another key point that's made in the report is, of course, the importance of the healthcare sector itself as an emitter of greenhouse gases. We know that if the global healthcare sector was a country, it would be about the fifth largest emitter on the planet, thanks to um, the important report by Healthcare Without Harm. 
And on the right, you can see the different uh, one, two, and three scope emissions from uh, the uh, National Health Service uh, in England. And you can see that many of the emissions are actually scope three, they're indirect emissions. So they're coming from supply chains, pharmaceuticals, uh, medical equipment, uh, transport systems, uh, and so on. So in addition to decarbonizing healthcare facilities, uh, reducing the, the uh, use of climate acting, uh, climate active agents, for example, in inhalers, propellants and inhalers. We also need to uh, tackle the indirect emissions, scope three emissions from supply chains by working with the pharmaceutical and the medical equipment industries. So there are a variety of pathways by which uh, climate action can benefit health. And it's really important to generate and implement evidence at scale and across a range of different sectors, energy, food and agriculture, uh, housing, of course, uh, the urban uh, environment, the healthcare sector, as I've mentioned. One, of course, is the nationally determined contributions that I've briefly touched upon uh, just um, a few moments ago. Uh, we can ensure that all nationally determined contributions include some reference to health and, as far as possible, quantify the benefits from health from moving towards a net zero carbon economy. National adaptation plans, too, need to foreground and to emphasize the potential to protect health. Climate finance needs to reflect more the importance of, of health uh, in ad the adaptation and mitigation agendas. And currently only a very small proportion of climate finance uh, projects really address the health implications of climate change. Litigation, we're seeing climate change litigation increasing in many countries of the world and health arguments will be important in buttressing the cases for our climate uh, litigation. We know that a lot of action going on at the subnational level, it's not just national governments, of course, that have varying levels of ambition, but many city governments through urban networks like C40 and others are actively engaged in climate action plans that uh, do emphasize health benefits. We talked, uh, I've talked briefly about climate resilience and net zero emission health systems. We know, of course, that 52 nations signed up at COP26, and 14 of those put a, a date uh, by which they would be net zero. And lastly, of course, there's a real need to invest more in evaluative research to examine what really happens when you implement change on the ground. It's not just a question of modeling. We need to understand what happens when a change is implemented uh, on the ground. So there are continuing roles for ac academies in engagement following publication of, of the, the regional and the global synthesis report. Three uh, broad uh, spatial scales nationally by working with policymakers, uh, helping to inform the decisions that are being made to make them contextually uh, relevant. Regionally, taking account of geographical, socioeconomic and cultural variability and globally. Importantly, incorporating the voice of those from low middle income countries from vulnerable groups who are, who are not always heard in this debate and emphasizing the imperative for health equity and climate justice. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Well, as I indicated earlier, unfortunately, um, Andy was unable to join us, but we are fortunate uh, for the question and answer period to have uh, Dr. Robin Fierce, who not only is the lead writer on the global report, but was also very active in writing the ESAC report. So he will be there to answer questions. Um, as I indicated in the IANIS report, we put in a number of case studies uh, to underline um, uh, different aspects um, of climate change and health. And one of them was related to waters in the Caribbean. And now it's a pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Martin Ford, who will be, uh, who presented on this, and he will be here obviously later uh, to answer questions on this subject. So with no further ado, uh, I hand over uh, to Martin Ford. Thank you. Hi, I'm Martin Ford. I'd like to share with you or review with you some of the adverse effects of climate change on health in one part of the world, region of the world, that is the Caribbean SIDS. Small island developing states are a group of countries recognized by the United Nations with shared circumstances that place them at unique or specific risk to climate change. There are three identified by the United Nations 
And the area that I'd like to focus on is the Caribbean SID, small island developing states. There are 28 of them. And if you look on the map here, you can see them listed here. Uh, compared to the other two SIDs for the period 1966 to 2015, of these three SID UN identified regions, the Caribbean SIDs experienced 60% of all climate related disasters, 90% of, of all deaths, 79% of all affected per or uh, persons affected came from the Caribbean, and 90% of all the damages in these three SID uh, regions was or occurred in the Caribbean. Uh, some characteristics of, uh, of SIDS are uh, that they're small. As you can see on the map on the right there where the name is much bigger than the dot that they occupy on the map. They have small populations that are growing uh, in urban centers. And so a lot of the development is taking place in coastal areas or within two kilometers of coastlines. Many SIDS, or in fact all SIDS, have limited resources. They are very susceptible to natural disasters and have a very heavy dependence on international trade and an international assistance, for example, when disasters strike to recover. And their economies are based on the natural resources. And those natural resources are, as we realize, heavily impacted or adversely impacted by climate change. And so the economies are fragile due to the impact of climate change on those environments and ecosystems uh, being negatively impacted. As an example of one of the impacts of climate that climate change is having on a resource, water, uh, it's causing or leading or exacerbating water insecurity in many Caribbean cities. The dry season now is longer, and when the rain does come, it comes in unpredictable manner and is experienced as extreme events. Examples in recent times of unprecedented droughts are in Grenada, for example, in 2010, and in 2015 in Haiti and Jamaica, uh, further heightened and illustrated the risk of water insecurity in many of these uh, countries in this region of the world. In terms of the economic impact of um, climate change or the impact climate change has on the uh, economies, uh, climate change is projected to lead to an average GDP annual loss worldwide of 0.5% uh, GDP by 2030. If you're looking at the SIDS, for example, in the Pacific, that increases to 0.75 to 6.5% uh, loss in GDP by 2030. And for the Caribbean, uh, annual losses of up to 5% in three years for 2025. And if nothing is done, no mitigation strategies are employed, we can expect annual uh, GDP losses of 20% by the term. Climate change also is impacting or uh, creates specific uh, uh, threats to the Caribbean healthcare system. For example, climate sensitive uh, vector borne diseases like dengue, chikungunya, uh, chikungunya, Zika, even yellow fever and malaria has made its appearance back again in the Caribbean and several islands, places additional burden on healthcare systems that are already limited and burdened uh, in their ability to adequately care for the populations they serve. Uh, additionally, many uh, healthcare delivery systems are located in coastal areas and therefore it makes them very vulnerable to hurricanes, floods, or the utilities being damaged by these uh, climatic events. As an example, here is the main hospital for the island of Grenada. As you can see, it is literally located on right on the coast. Uh, if for whatever reason you have to visit this facility, uh, it probably will provide you the most scenic views, but the caveat is provided the weather holds. And so steps that are being taken to mitigate the effects of climate change in Caribbean SIDS. In 2017, PAHO, uh, the WHO arm of 
of WHO for uh, the Americas, uh, came up with an action plan that envisions that by 2030, all healthcare systems in the Caribbean will be resilient to climate variability and change. And then in uh, 2020, the European Union has provided a fund of up to 7 million euros, a five-year project aimed at strengthening climate resilient health systems in the Caribbean. Uh, the goal is to uh, contribute to reduced mortality and morbidity from expected health consequences of climate change in, uh, clim in Caribbean countries. So summarizing uh, the impact of climate change on health in the Caribbean, one, we see that climate change is already significantly impacting Caribbean SIDS. Morbidity and mortality is unfortunately expected to rise due to the adverse impacts of climate change. And as a result of that, efforts are now being taken to strengthen um, healthcare systems that are vulnerable to climate change impacts. Uh, one of the things that is currently on, on being taken is health vulnerability and adaptation assessments are now being conducted and so that each country policymakers will now have access to health national adaptation plans in their planning process that incorporates taking climate change and strengthening the healthcare system. More to say, but hopefully in the discussion we'll be able to uh, talk a little bit more about this. I'm looking forward to your comments and thoughts on this. Thank you, Martin, um, for a very good overview of the situation with SIDS and particularly with the um, Caribbean region, which obviously has the susceptibility of being very heavily affected. Um, we would now like to, um, I'd like, now like to ask um, Chris Ebay to, to come and uh, to speak. Uh, Chris had been very instrumental and stepped in and did a great deal of writing for this report. So it's a real pleasure to have her here um, to talk more about the um, adaptation side of dealing with climate change and the question of health. So Chris. Good morning. Adaptation is one of the two main policy options for managing a change in climate. Adaptation is defined as the process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and its effects. In human systems, adaptation seeks to moderate harm and to exploit potentially beneficial opportunities. When we think about adaptation, there's three main areas in which we focus. The first is reducing exposures to climate-related hazards. And there's lots of ways we can think about coastal hardening, for example to reduce exposure to storm surge. The second is reducing the vulnerability of exposed communities, exposed regions. How can we better manage the exposures that are currently happening and are projected to happen into the future? And the third is building the capacity of communities and of our health systems to be able to better manage a changing climate. For health systems, the core activity is strengthening our health systems to make them climate resilient and environmentally sustainable. Many countries in the Americas have taken the first step in that process by conducting vulnerability and adaptation assessments. These assessments identify the vulnerabilities of populations in terms of exposure to heat, for example, or vector-borne diseases or undernutrition and then identifies the policies and measures that can be modified from current policies and measures, or the new ones that can be implemented to better prepare communities for a changing climate. As countries go through this process of conducting vulnerability and adaptation assessments, they then can build the health component of a national adaptation plan to make sure that health is a critical element within national adaptation planning. Health needs to not only focus on our own health systems, but also needs to mainstream these issues into the upstream drivers of health, of making sure that health is involved, for example, in transportation plans, 
that as transportation plans evolve to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, those plans also take into account how to increase active transport so that the health benefits of mitigation can be reaped. There's lots of other sectors where it's critically important to reach out and make sure that health is part of those policies and plans. When we look into a changing future, into building these climate resilient, environmentally sustainable health systems, there's many constraints. The key constraint is financing. Overall, the financing for health adaptation is a tiny, tiny fraction of all the money spent on adaptation. We need to find ways to increase those investments to make sure that health systems have the human and financial resources that they need to be able to address the changing climate. And no matter how proactive we are with developing our climate resilient and environmentally sustainable health systems, they'll continue to be residual risks. So we also need to build the capacity to manage those additional risks as we go forward into an even different future. We wanna make sure that overall we protect and promote human health as the climate continues to change. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, and again, as I remind everybody, if you have questions for any individual speaker, you might identify it or in a, just a broad one that we can discuss when we get to the question and answer period, feel free to do so. Um, as noted, we um, included uh, a number of case studies and I'm really uh, privileged to um, have uh, uh, Inez and Charlie join us because as Sherry Lee mentioned, the Arctic is very highly impacted already by uh, ongoing climate change. So I'm now pleased that they're going to present a perspective from the Arctic. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, my name is Charlie Flowers. I'm from Riglan and Nanatsuvut, and I've been doing research on climate change and health um, for over 10 years in the Nanatsuvut region. Hi, my name is Anna Shawak, and same as Charlie, I'm from Riglan, and I've been working in the climate change and mental health field for research for probably about 10 plus years now. Uh, these are a few of the topics that come up in uh, the report uh, about uh, climate change and the impacts on Indigenous health. Um, we're going to be focusing on a few that have come up in our research uh, and talk about those today. I think when you look at how climate change affects our access to the land or our access to finding food, country foods or, or being able to get out on land to show uh, to do hunting or trapping with the younger generation, it makes you wonder what what route you will take. Sort of like the route that my my dad took or the route that my grandfather took will be totally different from what I take or what they show me or how to go about getting out on the land. I think when you look at getting out on the land or being able to be out on land for your mental health, you, it's sort of freeing. You're sort of so relaxed yeah. in the cabin or just being out on the land. It's different. It, I think you have a different thought process and it sort of helps with like how you heal with yeah. your mental health as well. And even like things like checking your Facebook every five, 10 minutes, you know, <laughs> you don't have that out on the land. It's just quiet and still. And once you get out there, it's a real stress reliever. It's just good for your mental health. And when you don't have access to that, like say, with storms or bad ice or things of that nature, then we really miss it. And, and those stresses of town life can really pile up on you. So if you know climate is preventing you from going out and getting those things, it, it's really hard on you, <laughs> to say the least. Well, we live in a place that's isolated, uh, except for planes that come in in the winter. Um, so whenever anybody is sick, they have to be airlifted to the closest hospital, which is in Goose Bay, over 100 miles away. Um, but even like that, sometimes, like right now, I know the beds are all full in Goose Bay and people are having to be flown out to St. Anthony. So if the weather is bad between here and Goose Bay, you can't get out of here. Um, but then with the added distance of going to St. Anthony or St. John's, 
the weather might be bad between Goose Bay and those places, which is, you know, lot, hundreds of miles away. So, I mean, any weather disruption can keep a patient who's seriously ill here longer than is necessary, really. Yeah. Well, for our clinic, uh, we only have two nurses, like we don't have a doctor. Um, our doctor usually comes in once a month. Our medevacs, they're not these big dash sheets or anything, they're twin otters. Mm -hmm. And that puts a lot of strain, strain on like when a plane can actually fly in. If the wind comes up to more than 50 kilometers an hour, the plane is not going to fly. Yeah. So we have, so that's another part that affects like how we go to appointments as well as if, if the wind is at a certain speed, our twin otters aren't going to come in. Yeah. Our, we can't have dash eights land here because we don't have a big enough yeah. runway. So this is the plane that we're dependent on and it, that plane depends on how the weather is. So the weather affects how the planes get here as well. And it affects how our nurses can really deal with the problems that we do have sometimes here in the community. I think if we're going to survive, it's something that we have to do. Like we have to come up with our own solutions for dealing with climate change and the impacts that it's having on our communities. When you don't live as close to the land as we do up here in Riglet, uh, and you're living in the cities, it's hard to see those impacts of the climate change. And, you know, you might think, oh, wow, in you know, February, it's 12 degrees here. It's such a nice day, you know, walking around the city. And I guess it is, but it's having a major impact on people here and how we can get around and, and you know, interact with the land and uh, do the traditional things we always done. The impacts are far more than, you know, ice not forming at a certain time. It has impacts on every aspect of our life really. I think one of the things I would like for people to take away from this presentation would be to be considerate, to understand that when we talk about being on the land or when we talk about being with family or doing things with family, those are things that are important for us to keep our culture alive, to be able to connect to others. So always be kind, always yeah. be considerate of others. Thank you very much indeed for that perspective, which unfortunately many of us uh, do not realize when we think about this, which is why, um, as Andy mentioned in his report, uh, in his talk, we're very concerned that everybody's voice and everybody's um, uh, uh, life is considered when we are making policy statements. So we now have um, finished with the actual recording. So we will go over live um, and uh, open up the panel for uh, discussions. Um, at this point in time, uh, the audience is being very reticent in asking, uh, putting forward questions. I noticed one uh, that I'll just throw out there because it was mentioned um, in terms of uh, adverse weather effects somebody had written in that there have been heavy rains in um, Petropolis just outside of uh, north of Rio de Janeiro. In fact, an area where, very close to where I actually work on some other research. And um, they were questioning about um, how Brazil would fit into the report and is it a country that we should be giving more attention to. So I think maybe I'll hand that one over right away to Sherry because um, as uh, you know, the box that Martin mentioned was just one as an example. So if you'd like to address that, maybe Martin, you could leap in as well. Yeah, sure. I can get us started and, and others can, can join in. Um, the report does cover Brazil, certainly, and it covers um, pre precipitation events, especially extreme ones, um, and, and how that impacts a number of different facets of health, um, especially vector-borne disease. There's actually a case study um, in, in the report um, that looks at um, rainfall patterns and, and how it's uh, been, been impacting vector-borne disease, and also some examples of um, different collaborations between different institutions um, in Brazil and, and other countries on, on uh, addressing some of those. Martin, would you like to say something here? to the Caribbean, um, as mentioned, the 28 different countries, islands, and countries that could be mentioned. It's interesting that the effect of climate change is not homogenous across the region. So if I were to take just Grenada as an example, um, 
yes, we're going to have rising temperatures. Interesting, it's projected based on some of the modeling that there will be a decrease actual, a decrease in total precipitation. And in terms of um, extreme wet rainfall, there will be more or less the same projected over the, uh, up until the turn of the century. But in other islands, that's not the same. So, but, but those events where we're getting in general longer uh, dry spells, the dry, the dry season is longer and rainfall events are more intense when they do come. Uh, it's not uncommon to hear of, you know, a month's average of rain falling within a day or a couple of hours. Those are not rare events. They're almost becoming, quote unquote, the norm uh, expected going forth. So very important to, um, um, I think the, the, the person was interested about whether a particular country is represented. I would say that the Caribbean region is a particular area that we need to pay specific attention to because we tend to get lost in the Latin America uh, and the Caribbean uh, umbrella term. The Caribbean tends to not stand out or be, have its, its issues brought to the fore. So it's very important. It's very good to see that the UN has identified this area as a particular area that is impacted by climate change. So um, the answer, short answer is that um, this is a phenomenon that does affect some islands, not all, but um, is a real event where we have these intense periods of rainfall and therefore the, the downside of that, that comes from that. I mean, very obviously um, it's not just the Americas or Brazil. We today in the last few days, looking at Australia, there are some very serious events there and there have been a number in Europe. Um, does anybody else want to address on that subject? But if not, there's one other that several of us are so, okay, we've got evidence-based, we're putting reports together, but how are we dealing with and how are we getting to politicians who are the ones that obviously are going to have to make uh, the rules that will allow us to actually act on what we know needs to be acted upon? I might start off actually with Robin um, in terms of uh, what sort of interactions happened following the very original report that came out of ESAC? And, um, uh, you know, how did that move forward? And what might we learn from those lessons as we move forward in um, with this report and the other global report? Yeah, th thank you, Jeremy. I, I guess the first lesson is indeed one that we, we, we all know. Um, the report alone isn't enough. Um, it has to be followed up and used. Um, and in that sense, developing a sustained relationship with policymakers and politicians is important rather than just coming along saying, oh, we've got a new report uh, that should be of interest to you. Um, so a sustained relationship. Um, so secondly, of course, engagement with politicians and other policymakers in the community uh, occurs at different levels, at local, national, regional, and global. Uh, and to some extent, the uh, approach to engaging with those different political communities will, will vary. Um, but I think in, in all cases, uh, for those of us in, in the scientific community, how we engage must be based on um, excellent science because of the credibility must be relevant to be relevant for the politician at the appropriate time um, must be based on a sustained relationship you, you, you asked Jeremy particularly about the ESAC report which as you'd already mentioned in some regards was a, a forerunner for, for the other regional reports and, and indeed I'm take this opportunity to say that, um, it, in fact, it, although there was a difference in timing, essentially all four regional uh, activities started from similar starting points, so that we can, as it were, compare the endpoints because we know we started in the same place. But, but anyway, lo looking back at the ESAP report, I, I think it, it, in Europe, um, we, we have an advantage over um, some other regions that uh, perhaps including the Americas, in that we do have relatively mature uh, regional 
political institutions through the European Commission and the European Parliament. Sadly, as I'm sure you all know, my country, UK, is no longer part of that process. Um, but in policy terms, um, we, we can talk to politicians um, who have responsibilities for the entire region, uh, as well, of course, as their national roles. So to some extent, that, that facilitates the processes of, of engagement that they may be difficult to uh, replicate, replicate in, in other regions, or, although in Africa, the, the African Union uh, provides something of a uh, similar basis for of the scientific community across the continent of Africa to engage with policymakers across Africa. But, but even where those regional political institutions don't exist, um, there are ways of engaging at the regional level as well as the national level. And, and many of these issues uh, for, for the research priorities or climate justice or, or climate finance, uh, Andy talked about, for example, do have regional as well as national connotations. And there are a number of um, policy groups within the intergovernmental bodies, the UN in particular, with FAO, WHO, uh, UNDP, uh, UNEC, uh, and so on. But, but other intergovernment models like G7 and G20, uh, and certainly our experience in our IAP has been to develop the, the experience of engaging with, with that uh, plurality of, of different bodies. Uh, and to that extent, we, we have drawn upon our um, uh, burgeoning experience in, in Europe uh, to, to understand, those, you know, to, to, to engage at uh, middle ranking levels of, of politicians, if, if you like, for example, the ones who can make a difference to in, in policy determination. Um, and, and the other point i finish is, is that it does take time and resource. It doesn't uh, stop with the, with the report. So for example, um, go, going back to a, a previous uh, global interregional project, Jeremy, that, that, that you know very well on food and nutrition security and agriculture. Essentially the reports there were, were finished in 2018, but we're still actively using those uh, at the national, regional uh, and global levels. And just last year that they were quite influential, I, I think, when we engaged in, in the UN Food Systems Summit uh, and, and helped to steer some of that policy development based on, on, on work we completed three years earlier. Um, so, so I think you, know, you, you do have to kind of take a life cycle approach to engage with politicians, even recognising, of course, that politicians change and... Uh, you know, that there may be a new set that, that you need to engage with and build trust with. Uh, it, it is a skill. Uh, it, it does take time. Thank you, Robin. Does any, do any other the panel members wish to jump in on this point of how we can reach and effectively deal with politicians? Chris, you look, I saw you turn off your mic, on your mic. Thank you. And I really want to underscore some of the points from Robin, in particular, the critical role of finance. There just has not been financing around climate change and health. When you look internationally under the adaptation funds, less than 0.5% goes to health. And so the communication to policymakers is critically important, but that needs to be matched by investments. And without the investments that are going into other sectors, human health is being harmed. And we need to make the message much stronger that Without those investments, more and more people are going to be harmed. It is unrealistic to expect that the health sector alone can pay for the damages of climate change. No other sector is being asked alone to step up and manage all of the damages. And without a healthy population, you can't have a healthy economy. So we need to start very, cl very clearly with health and make sure we have the investments that we need and there's been great advances in the last couple of years through PAHO and other regional organizations to really increase the emphasis on climate change and health. I look forward to seeing how that's going to advance over the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sherry Lee, do you have anything you want to add at this point? 
Um, no, but I, I mean, I think that that's really, I think it's a really key question. Um, and it's something that we've spent a lot of time um, talking about and thinking about and, and planning because there are a, a lot of reports um, that are being done and, and it's really important to, to take this and, and to move it into the next step so it doesn't just sit on a shelf somewhere and that it's actually useful um, for the, the people that the report was intended to serve. Um, uh, we had a question about, isn't, couldn't a case be made that there is, it's going to cost much more if we do nothing than spending on it is actually going to pay back multi, many times over. And in actual fact that I'll let you address that because it was covered in the report and it is, has been made that, you know, investing actually isn't costing money. It is going to save money and can also save um, the impact on the health of human beings and the many animals that they actually um, care about. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, I think that these things have to go <laughs> that the adaptation and mitigation pieces have to go hand in hand, which um, came came up in the in the presentations really clearly. I think um, that that we need to do both together, um, and we and we need to start now um, because not not only will the cost go up as warming goes up. Um, but also our, the number of options we have available to respond will also decrease. Um, so yes, it's, it's, I think that that underscores the urgency of it all as well. One thing that I, I did mention, but I will point out again, there are, the report itself is going to be uh, published in all four languages, um, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. But we have also, because um, Sherry Lee actually presented at COP last fall, and we've prepared a uh, pamphlet, not just a very dry um, executive summary, but a pamphlet that is being printed up again in all four languages that will be available for, because we're calling on all of the academies, obviously, to now use this and move forward to contact their own politicians at different levels. And having this sort of pamphlet um, in all of the different languages can definitely be used as we do further outreach. Because as, as Robin said, you know, um, the report comes out, but it's gonna be months and years as we continue to push and use this, um, uh, the, these documents to be able to impact change. Jeremy, if I, if I might add what, one other point, because I, I see it's just come up in, in another question. Uh, of course, there's the issue of engaging with the public as well as in, engaging with politicians. And, and I don't want to pre preempt um, you, 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 who you want to ask that question of, but, but indeed, um, academies can do more with their outputs uh, through national academies who often can engage well with, with their own public to, in their own country, in their own language. Um, so that is kind of a continuing role for um, individual academies. Uh, you mentioned just now that um, Sherrilee and, and I went to COP26, and I think that was an opportunity to hear about some of the, or hear from some of the groups that scientists we might not always engage with in, in terms of NGOs or ordinary members of the public who, who come to COP events. Um, so it's not just a question of, or as well as communicating our evidence and our perspectives, we need to engage with and, and listen to, to those in the community for their perspectives and their worries and, and their uh, thoughts of the future. Indeed, that was a question that came up. What are the plans for communicating with various uh, publics for the recommendations of this report? Um, I can only speak uh, for the Royal Society or for the situation in Canada, um, but we have um, a national organization called Let's Talk Science, which is very responsible, um, is involved in science in schools from kindergarten through um, high school. And the RSC and Let's Talk Science have just um, received a grant where we're working together to prepare modules on all aspects of climate change, which it will include health um, for uh, all levels of uh, school children, as I said, from kindergarten going through through grade, uh, you know, to uh, grade 12. And this will obviously be integrated. And again, we will call upon all of our academy members um, to engage in these activities. And again, IANIS itself has a program called Science in Schools, 
And this is, again, one of the aspects that can be done, and we need to do that. I do notice if, does anybody else want to leap in on that particular point in terms of reaching the various publics um, before I move on to a very specific question that just came up? I'd like to add quickly to that, there's some interesting research in the US that needs to be done in other countries in the Americas about the attitudes of the general public around climate change, mm -hmm. in general health specifically, one of the more interesting findings in the US is that about two thirds or three quarters of Americans are concerned about climate change, much higher than you'd expect from looking at the media. Mm -hmm. About half of all Americans are concerned about climate change affecting their own health. But interestingly, only about a third of Americans talk with anyone else about climate change. That the political polarization has meant that people are concerned about this issue but don't talk to anybody else and finding ways to facilitate those discussions, encouraging people to talk with each other is going to be an important step forward. And just to, to build on that, um, more interesting actually research from the United States um, shows the important role that the health sector can play in that. Um, there has been work that's looked at, you know, like what types of, of messaging or framing around climate change inspires people to take action. Um, and different framings like um, how climate change impacts our economy, how climate change impacts our national security, and how climate change impacts our health. Um, those different framings have, have been investigated and researchers have looked at what inspires people to take action. Um, and and it, I think it surprises some people to learn that it's actually how climate change impacts our health that inspires the, the most people to, to take action and to have these discussions, even more so than things like how it impacts our economy or how um, it, it impacts our national security. So I think that health, um, the topic of health plays a really important role in that too. If, if I might, may add to, to, to that discussion, perhaps to introduce what seems to be a paradox that, um, you know, I think we all agree that health messages are, are, are important in communicating more broadly about climate change impacts. And indeed that there are um, significant adverse health consequences of climate change now and, and in the future. And, and, and yet, um, if you look at the output from the most recent COP26, and there was a lot of discussion about health on the floor of a meeting of COP26, there was very, very little in, in the final communique, that so-called Glasgow Compact. Health does not figure very prominently in the uh, UNFCCC conclusions. Um, how can we change that? How, how can we give health that the greater visibility that it needs in, in these global political discussions about climate change. I, we have another broad question here, actually interesting enough from one of my colleagues in my own department, who because of COVID I haven't seen um, in many, many months. Um, and Norm has asked, don't we have to deal with the dilemma of climate change and our dependence on a growth economy? Climate change mitigation should include shift away from our dependence on a growth economy and continued consumption of city state economy focused on support of increased maintenance of our society to enhance resilience. So does somebody want to take on that? As obviously continuous growth does yeah. sort of, interestingly enough, Malthus had ideas about what would happen with continuous growth, but that was talking about normal populations, not economy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, the, the, the debate on alternatives to GDP as, as a measure uh, of hu human uh, well-being or, or, or whatever goes back quite a long way. And it, it, I, I, it's, it's not obvious that it's made much progress. It's not obvious to me. Sorry, I'm not an economist. Um, but, but, but indeed, uh, that, that is a... Uh, uh, the, the very important discussion to keep having alternatives to GDP, but uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, uh, you know, there's the analogy with regard to the um, the uh, plans for a sustainable green recovery after COVID, and, and talked about the intersection between COVID nineteen and, and climate change. Uh, a number of countries promised uh, a, a green economic recovery package where there would be objectives for uh, environmental sustainability and equity and, and health, as well as fiscal recovery. 
in, in most cases, those promises are don't seem to be being kept. Uh, and, and the focus is yet again on re renewed economic growth. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask a couple of very specific questions. The one that um, has come up, and it was a question specifically for doc, uh, Dr. Ford, and what are uh, some specific concrete examples for adaptation measures that need to be implemented in the Caribbean health infrastructure? For example, for St. George's Hospital on the coast in Grenada, um, what would actually be needed to increase the resilience of the hospital? So I'll hand that one over to Martin. Yeah, before I, I answer the, the question specifically, I just want to indicate or, or draw, remind us that, you know, the impact of climate change on the Caribbean in particular is it brings to fore an equity issue. Um, we, we, we contribute very little to the problem, but bear a disproportionate impact of its negative impacts. And that impact, for example, uh, is being felt in one area, particularly as a healthcare system. I showed you an image of, of our main hospital located on the, coast, on the coast. That's just where it historically was, and, and it has been built and, and further enhanced on the coast. The question is, well, that's not really the best place for it. It should go elsewhere. And, and we have looked at options of moving it elsewhere, but that costs money. And so um, the, the issue of, of, of trying to mitigate or adapt to climate change is one that um, I would say the policymakers are well aware of, but are constrained by the lack of resources. Another key characteristic of SIDS is limited resources and a heavy dependence on external sources, one to for example, deal with disasters when they occur, hurricanes, we, we need extensive uh, aid to uh, bound, rebound from that, but also to rebound or to, to adapt our healthcare systems. Um, in 2020, the European Union has provided funding, for example, of up to 7 million euro, um, actually, yes, euro, to, to help uh, uh, to create a more resilient healthcare system in the in the Caribbean, and in part that uh, there's a, a feature called climate smarting, or, or smart healthcare facilities, where healthcare facilities, for example, right here in Grenada, are being made climate smart, um, strengthening their their systems, strengthening their ability to deal with climate related events. So funding is being brought to bear to help our healthcare system adapt to the new norms that climate change is in bringing upon us. But again, just want to emphasize that that money is externally sourced. And uh, if we did not have access to that, we would not have the ability to do what we know we should do, but can't due to a lack of resources. So. Uh, there is money now being put toward this effort and hopefully it will be sufficient to help us um, because I think as several presentations have shown, the effects of climate change are, are almost baked in. And so we have to prepare for that reality. In fact, we're experiencing it and uh, we'll probably need more money in the future to continue that process. Um, and hopefully that will come, time will tell. Thank you. Well, you, you did mention that the SIDS in the Caribbean um, uh, contribute little but bear the brunt of much of the impact. And that also holds true um, for the Arctic. And um, I would like to actually ask Charlie and Ina now, um, what could um, we learn from the experiences of the Inuit and other indigenous communities um, that would help us to increase our resilience and to actually protect the health of all of the communities. Sorry, I missed that. What was that? Um, I was saying that there was a question raised by one of the observers. What lessons can we actually learn from the experiences that the Inui and other indigenous communities have um, uh, had to go through as it relates to increased resilience and uh, health uh, protection of the health. 
Uh, well, one thing we can learn is it happens really fast. Like even in my lifetime, I'm 38 right now, and the impacts that I've seen are pretty astounding. I, I think once they start here, I think we're going to be like um, uh, sort of like an early sign for what's going to happen in the South. And so uh, I think it's you, you really need to get prepared for this because it will change you know, your way of life. It'll change everything about it, really. I think it also underlines the urgency of uh, action right away. If you can see it in your lifetime, as many of us have in different ways, we really, we do have a responsibility to bang the drum more, if you like, to get the politicians to listen so that we can actually um, act rather than just talk about things. Are there any other comments, questions that um, anybody? No, I, I, I have a couple of questions for the, the yeah. panelists, just as the presentations were going, um, if, if I could jump in and, and maybe go ahead and, and ask. So I have, I have one question for Chris and I have one question for Charlie and, and Ines. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that there was this very interesting discussion about what, um, how reports can be used for more than just a report. And, and Chris, you've been on so many assessment reports <laughs> for in so many different um, capacities for so many different organizations. And I was just, I was first wondering if you, if you have any reflections on how reports can be um, best, best mobilized um, and, and how reports like this can actually um, help, help move the needle forward. Um, because we've talked about the urgency and the need for action. We've talked about how, um, how we like we, have a good sense of what needs to be done. We just need to do it. So how can you use a report like this to, to mobilize some of those, those actions? It's a really good question, Shirley, and something that all the organizations think about. What's worked really effectively is working with other organizations who do further outreach. So work with the NGOs and the, the groups that work in the Arctic to reach out to specific Arctic communities that we have to recognize our limitations from the scientific perspective and reaching down to that very local level and finding the partners who can do that. That's happened with the IPCC with a lot of outreach from other groups and it's really made a big difference. Um, and, and then I had a question for Charlie and Ines in, in their presentation, um, they had this great remark that um, everything's interconnected. Um, and, and I know that some of their, your research, Charlie and Ines, has looked at how climate change impacts, um, you know, people's ability to, to get out on the land and to get food, which you had mentioned. And I was just wondering if, if you might be able to describe how that impacts health. Like, does it impact nutrition? Does it impact mental health? Does it impact, like, you know, safety when people are out on the land trying to, to get those foods um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could describe that a little bit more because I thought that was a really interesting comment that everything's inter interconnected and I was wondering if you could give some examples um, through, through food. Okay, uh, yeah, everything really is interconnected. Uh, I mean, in terms of like, whether you're able to get out on the land to get certain things or, you know, do these things. We do a lot of hunting and fishing and things like that, berry picking up here in the north. And like when you're working office jobs, you're probably only getting two weeks or maybe even three weeks off a year. And so you really got to plan out when you're going to go and do your hunting, gathering and fishing. And like if the weather is bad at those times, you really can't get out to do those things. And if you can't do that, you're, you're, you know, your diet is going to suffer not to mention your mental health for getting out on the land and carrying out your traditional practices, that will suffer. I mean, it affects everything. And it's, it's so hard to explain because everything is interconnected. And when you take one little aspect of that, you know, a part of your life falls away, really. It's just, it's everything to be able to do those things. And when you can't, it really affects every aspect of your life. Um, Charlie, one somebody wrote, um, and part of the question was um, whether you and Ennis could speak to the what um, the actual community, uh, the communities themselves are implementing as adaptation, or is it even possible at this point in time? Well, it's definitely possible. Uh, I just mentioned like hunting and stuff like that, and fishing and. 
Um, we have in each of the Nanatsuvo communities now, we have a community freezer um, where uh, you can go and pick up wild game or, or berries and stuff there. But like we've had a big impact here. The George River caribou herd was the largest, I think, caribou herd in North America, anyway, certainly. And it has plummeted. So we've been had a hunting ban on that for years now, a couple few years. And it's really impacted people's lives because I mean, caribou is, you know, a traditional food source for us and we love that. Um, but one thing that's within the Nazi of what we've done is I had a partnership with one of the um, um, one of the parks in Newfoundland on the island, the mm -hmm. portion of the province, where they've had too many moose. So we would send hunters down there to call some of the moose, and then we would have the meat distributed amongst the communities here in the Nutsiva, which is a big help, you know, when we're missing, you know, a big source of our traditional food. Um, there's probably others that I'm uh, other things that I'm not thinking of right at the moment. Ayesh, can you think of any? Sorry, what well, was the question? Just as you were asking it, somebody came in with the phone, so I don't, I didn't quite hear it. It was uh, uh, the sort of adaptations that are being um, used in the community to cope with the undesirable changes that climate uh, climate change is having on everyday life. Well, it's, well, some of the things that have been happening within our communities is the fact that we now have um, community freezers. Mm. So in our community freezers, we actually have, we're able to have access to some of these wild foods that we can't get, such as partridges, moose, um, berries like baked apples and red berries. Like if you can't get on the land to get it yourself, there is this option that uh, each community has a community freezer that we are able to access. Um, there's been a lot of more, a lot more programming for youth and getting them more into doing traditional skills or learning traditional knowledge within our communities. Um, I know with some of the research we've done, we've taken, it's been youth and mentorship programs where, where the youth are learning from sort of experts in our community who are teaching them traditional skills or traditional knowledge and they're able to take that and pass it on to the next generations. But I also know that a lot of families are taking it upon themselves to start teaching their children and not just waiting till they're a certain age to do stuff. So I know like with um, my brother and his oldest son, like he's 12 years old and he can go off and set his own trap line or he can go off and hunt his own partridges if he wants because he's trusted. Like when we look at somebody, a 12 year old who might be going off with a shotgun, like it's the norm here. Like we, that's how we grew up. I think we're losing some of those things because of climate change because people are scared but people are also learning to adapt to these changes by teaching their children at a younger age to respect the land and to respect like hunting and doing stuff with children. So I think like it's doing it at a community level, at a, at a, a regional level, but it's also doing it as a family level sort of thing. Like people are always taking something, but they're sort of passing it on to others. So there's all kinds of stuff like when know with, our DHSD, which is the Department of Health and Social Development, they sort of have um, a craft night, but it's a place for people to gather who do crafts. And it's, it's more of a social thing, like you're getting people to get out who may not have gotten out because of the weather, because they can't go off on the land, but they're able to do this because this program is there. And it's connecting one generation to the next, because I know me and my mom, we tend to go to it we're not just connecting with each other, but we're connecting with others. So any kind of program that you see going on within the next foot is sort of adapting to the change in what's happening around us. And if I could um, like add, add on to that, um, I think those are, are great examples. Thanks so much, Charlie and Ines. And, and, and what um, research shows, not just in the Arctic, um, or not just in Nazi, but, but across the Arctic and not just in the Arctic, but for a lot of different indigenous communities, um, adaptation strategies are more successful when they're underpinned by Indigenous knowledge systems, like Charlie and Ines just described the importance of those traditional skills um, and, and, and knowledge um, coming into it is, is really, really critical um, for, for success in these communities. And the other thing that um, I, I think that the research shows and the report shows is that the importance of um, Indigenous self-determination in those, um, you know, the Indigenous communities know what they need. Um, to, to adapt and, and making sure that um, 
they're, they're in a position where they can, where they can do that. And so I think that the examples that Charlie and Anna just gave are, are really important ones and really show the importance of, of how Inuit and other Indigenous people know, know what they need um, and, and know what they need to adapt. In truth. Excellent. Are there any other comments? Um, quite a, we haven't got any more questions coming in right now. Could I just return, if, if I may, um, to, to, to the issue of um, working at the, uh, the continental regional level. Um, a, a number of the climate change effects on, on health cross national boundaries. I mean, whether that's um, fossil fuel or, or wildfire induced air pollution or, or vector borne infectious diseases or, or uh, forced displacement of populations because of uh, food and nutrition insecurity. Are there examples uh, from across the Americas how countries can work together to tackle these issues, whether that's in terms of, I, I don't know, uh, early warning systems for infectious disease or, or, or other uh, collaborative activity, um, perhaps not across the whole of a continent, um, but within um, parts of Latin America or, or, or North America, where countries can work together. I, I, I realize they work together in research collaborations, but in terms of uh, adaptation measures, uh, are this an example? Thank you, Robin. We have another question with the interconnectedness that was brought up by several. How do the panelists see climate and uh, human health fit within the One Health concept, which of course has been discussed in, in indirectly? So would anybody like to um, consider that? I have to say, as an ecologist, um, one of the things that always bothers me is the lack of interconnectedness when I have students and even colleagues who say things like plants, animals, and human beings. And I think that's part of the mindset that has caused some of our problems of not recognizing our interrelatedness. But having pushed that as the, as the uh, chair here, I will pass it over to the panelists to um, discuss how this all fits in within the, really the broader concept of One Health. I, I could say that the, as I mentioned, the EU, the EU uh, which is contributing seven million pounds to help us strengthen our um, resilience of the healthcare system is specifically using a One Health approach. So the mechanism um, is not just, you know, the, the, the so-called humans are the, the, the prime target or uh, although they usually are, but through the One Health lens, um, that is the mechanism that they're using to, to strengthen the healthcare system. So. And, and, and to speak a little bit to um, Robin's issue about is there evidence of collaboration among nations? Um, within the Caribbean, there is. And I think by default, we have to. We, we're just too small to have a prayer of a chance of trying to make any way of standing up to the Goliath of climate change. So we have banded by uh, out of pure necessity to tackle and so a lot of the funding that comes is funneled through our um, regional bodies like CARICOM. And um, we have the, the five Cs, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center um, to, to address this. So we, we come at it as a region, but I'm not aware of, um, well, one could argue that the fact that the EU is providing funding to help us is a form of collaborating. Um, but, you know, is there collaboration between us and, let's say, North America? I, I have not seen that explicitly. I'm not aware of it. Well, there is another question that has just come in. Um, I did mention earlier that we had uh, the Royal Society as an uh, uh, partnership with Let's Talk Science in the schools. And as I said, we're preparing modules um, 
four different uh, levels of education, but one of the ad, uh, approaches is not to preach at the younger people, but to engage them and challenge them and get their, their thoughts on what it is. And so Rachel raised the question here, what advice do the panelists have for young people and youth activists? Uh, what lessons do the panel, panelists think we can learn from young people? And before I throw it out, I'm gonna say we could learn an awful lot, in my opinion. We just need to learn to listen. Um, but I will open it up to the panelists. I can kick us off. I mean, I think um, for me personally, on a personal level, I have to say that the past, um, you, you know, three years, I've been really inspired by what youth have been doing around the world in terms of climate change action. Um, and and um, they've been doing a lot of things, but one of the things they have been doing is taking reports like this. Um, and they have been asking their decision makers um, to use these reports um, in, in the decision-making process. And, and so I think that this um, demand from youth of their decision-makers and of their elected representatives um, to use um, this, this type of science and this type of information in decision-making is, is really powerful. And, and I, I feel like, um, you know, we should all be doing more of that, really. Um, so I, I find that really personally really, really inspiring and um, definitely something that um, you know, I've learned from youth and wondered why we haven't started doing that earlier. <laughs> you know, I'll, really, I'll also add yeah. that there's a really great um, case study example um, about, about the like the youth movement in terms of climate change and climate change and health in the report. So I definitely um, recommend uh, check, checking that out. I think, uh, you know, people ask what we're going to do with the report. I think that, uh, you know, at each uh, each of the academies, hopefully we'll use this to perhaps prepare um, um, a policy statement that is very specific to their own country for the politicians. But at the same time, I think they should be working to take the information and put it into a format that can go to the younger people and initiate um, correspondence and interchange with the younger people um, so that we do here. Because, um, you know, a lot of it, you read nowadays um, examples of somebody in a, in a very isolated community where because of climate change, they couldn't do something. They, went, they developed um, a generator for their village and things like this, or a solar panel that worked. And I think they are perhaps more likely to be engaged and show innovation than some of us um, older ones. And I think it's important that we take these reports and use them not only we always think, how are we going to get to policymakers? We need to think, how do we get in every direction? And I would encourage all of the member academies to think along those lines. Uh, we have a question here of how much risk is coming from the greater intrusion of people into the un undeveloped natural environment. So we're asking people to love it, but leave it alone. So what, what are, I mean, obviously, and there's another question as, what are the lessons we've learned from COVID-19 to climate change? I mean, obviously one is that in both cases, it's underlined the inequalities in our, um, in our world and we must do everything we can for sure. And that was an underlying theme in the report as Sherry Lee pointed out, um, we must address that. But th that is an interesting thing. How do people think that we want to get and be more in tune with nature through a one world, one health uh, environment, but at the same time, destroying our habitat or getting a lot of tourists climbing in. I mean, as an entomologist, mm -hmm. I've always found it really weird that a person will, who claims to be interested in ecology will go in and destroy an environment in order to collect a damned insect to put in their collection, which seems totally irrational. There is quite a lot of discussion about um, the so-called nature-based solutions, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and there is some evidence um, for, for, for some potential benefits. Uh, of course, um, I think they have to be, or, or your authorities would say they have to be well designed and considered in conjunction with the local communities, including obviously the indigenous peoples. Uh, and there are some examples in the Americas 
uh, of importance of doing that. There, there are other examples that we use it in the global report that, um, from Africa, for example, where um, external donors funded um, afforestation of, of the savanna and, and other native uh, landscapes, probably to the detriment both of carbon capture, biodiversity and, and health of the population. So these things do have to be carefully designed. Well, does, does anybody have any uh, on this idea of what can we have learned from the pandemic other than the little thing that I just threw out there from the pandemic and its response to the pandemic that we could actually apply to climate change action? Well, we, we, we do have a section in, in the forthcoming uh, global report on, on this, both in terms of um, uh, what one could perceive as similarities between the um, the crises of, of COVID-19 and climate change, you know, but both can be regarded as global health emergencies uh, with, with the greatest impacts on those least able to, to bear the consequences. So there's similarities, um, there's intersections, such, such that, for example, um, uh, climate change induced flooding or, or, or uh, forced displacement of populations it impairs the response to COVID. I, I, equally, um, COVID may interfere with, with food systems, uh, transport of food, growing of food, but that um, creates additional pressures for already vulnerable groups. So, so there's intersections. But, but yes, I think there are lessons as, as well uh, from COVID that we can apply perhaps to climate change the importance of mobilizing at scale, importance of focusing on, on vulnerable populations, uh, importance of taking a, a, a global approach, if we did, um, importance of um, using information from citizens and, and the community in uh, understanding the issues. The importance, of course, at, at least in many of our countries, of of using scientific evidence to, to inform policy, to inform health policy. Now, that's not something that occurred, that's not up to quite that degree in, in many other um, examples that we can think about of uh, societal problems. But, but certainly in Europe, COVID did provide, an did provide the opportunity for the scientific community to help uh, in, in real time inform uh, policy development for, for good or bad. We have another interesting question that has come up that has asked, how does the health sector urge policymakers um, and those in it, the health workforce, to be included in the climate change conversation, particularly in a, in a country like Canada, where the provinces, territories um, are actually responsible for the delivery of health care, where you have, um, you know, regional rather than national? And how do we move that forward to get involved in the climate change situation? Because I mean, one thing that I, I think I suppose I come our way with from the uh, COVID-19 is um, science advice and how we deal with that at provincial levels, national levels and so on. And unfortunately, when one moves forward um, with the information at hand and then one changes one's mind um, because we have more information that sometimes raises red flags with people who don't want to listen and I think that's one thing we really do have to do and I think again it applies here with getting the various levels of, of uh, policymakers engaged in the conversation to realize how important it all is. Uh, that, that's exactly what, what we're right now doing here in the Caribbean. Um, we're strengthening the healthcare system to be resilient to a very specific target or threat, and that is climate change. Uh, the tool that is a key tool that is being used is to do health vulnerability and adaptation assessments with the goal of developing uh, an HNAP, a health national adaptation plan. So we have national adaptation plans, but now they're being reworked with a very specific focus on how climate change will impact health in its, in its entirety. So maybe 
you know, to, to bring climate change to the table, you have to incorporate it. So when, when you know, health policies are being created or being formulated, uh, a very specific line item should be, well, what is climate change going to, how does climate change impact on our healthcare system? Would, would bring it, so to speak, into the, the forefront. And so it's not a case which typically happens is that the healthcare system reacts to the impacts that climate change, but now it can anticipate and be resilient, be prepared to deal with um, the impacts that climate change will bring. And, and that, that is that I think that's if, if going back to, you know, what potentially are any silver linings that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to bear on climate change, I think it gives us a, a, a preview of what happens when you're not prepared. <laughs> um, we, we were not, you know, we had, you know, sort of international health regulations of what to do with a pandemic and WHO has all these nice documents. But the proof of the pudding was that when, you know, the pandemic broke forth, well, I don't need to tell anyone, you know, how prepared we were. I mean, it brought countries to their knees and some are still on their knees uh, trying to come back from this. So fast, uh, let's change the pandemic to climate change. You know, if we're not prepared, that's a preview of what is going to happen. You know, we, 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 the terms uh, tipping points, you know, we use it in academic uh, circles, but at some point, the pan, you know, climate change will reach a point where it will trigger COVID-like um, effects. And, and if we're not doing now, preparing various sectors of our, our, of our countries, health, let's take the healthcare, and, and we're not going, just like when, when people started coming to the hospitals, they were overwhelmed, they just couldn't handle it. Uh, we're going to have the same horror movie play out when climate change really starts to amp up. Um, I don't want to end on that pessimistic tone, <laughs> you know, but, um, I, you know, my concluding thoughts would be, I uh, just recently read um, uh, an article <laughs> Michael Mann, prime, a premier climatologist, has, has put out on um, that, the fact that you know th there's a budget, so to speak, of what we can do to continue to mess up the environment suggests that there is room for us, there's time for us to, to avert the very worst uh, outcomes of climate change. We're having some and we will have some more to come, but we do still have a window that is rapidly closing that we can do something to uh, firstly, prepare for the, the things that we've already done that are going to happen, but to avert the very worst outcomes of climate change. And um, the trick is to use this report and others to empower people to feel that they have a sense of agency. Mm -hmm. I can do something or we can do something, whether individually, regionally, collectively, and, and I, I, I suspect that one of the reasons for, for um, this report and the others that have been put out by the other uh, uh, agencies is to help inform everyone, politicians, common man on the street, um, young people, that we can, there's still time to do something. So let's hope that this <laughs> report does that. Thank you. Um, Shirley, you were going to have to, going to interject at that point, but there's one part that I would like you to address as well. Um, somebody had written in that they were, it was interesting, there were case studies and so on. Is there a discussion in the report about monitoring and evaluation of adaptation measurements that assess the longer term effectiveness of these measures? And um, if you'd like to close on that one, because we are running out of time. And if you would like to address that one point, um, and then we will close down the um, session. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess just quickly to say yes. Um, and that was written by uh, Dr. Ebai. So yeah. I definitely yeah. recommend um, checking checking that out. Um, it's, it's a critical part of, of adaptation for sure. 
excellent. Yeah, I was going to. Uh, I wasn't sure who sh whether I should put it to uh, Christy or not. Um, in that case, as we only have one and a half minutes left, I would like to thank all of the authors, um, reviewers who worked so very hard on this report, the steering committee, obviously, the various academies and the health sources, and um, hope that you will all actually, and everybody that attended today um, for joining us in this endeavor. I think this is the first step in many steps that this uh, document is going to have to go through to have the impact we hope it will. And uh, on that, I'm just going to hand over to my co-chair here, Sherry Lee, to let her say the final word, because as I said at the very beginning, um, she has been the, the rock on this whole report, getting us all through, because as you all know, with COVID, things didn't quite work out the way we had anticipated. So Sherry Lee, for you, and I'd like to again, just thank the Royal Society, um, Walter House staff for everything they've done to get this going and the IANIS uh, staff and also Joanna in Leopoldina for making sure that all of these things have been shared on social media, et cetera. So Sherry Lee, final um, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's my pleasure to, to have the, the final word. I just want to thank everyone for coming. And I'd really like to encourage everyone to reach out to their academy or to IANIS um, to engage with the report, um, you know, ask for lunch and learns, ask for presentations. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's people in your country, um, that have uh, been involved in, in the report or nearby who can, um, help com communicate with this and, and to engage with the report, um, beyond just reading it. So please do reach out to your, your academies, please reach out to IANIS, um, and let us know how we can, um, help mobilize this report into action. Um, thank you so much um, for, for everything. And I'll just say the report in the various languages will soon be available. There is a recording of this um, webinar. So please feel free to use any of the documents to advance the cause. Thank you all very much indeed.